Hello and welcome to 7 Days of Science, your weekly source for the latest science news. In the headlines this week, a study of shark evolution across deep time has revealed that these ancient fish are not as extinction-proof as we once thought, the interstellar visitor 3i Atlas made its closest approach to Earth this week, a lemon-shaped planet has been discovered, and much more. Before we get to the stories, do be sure to watch our last episode where we unboxed this year's Winter Curiosity Box. It's full of all sorts of fun items, including this 15th century map of what they thought the world looked like, which is made out of coasters. Also, on a separate note, stick around to the end to learn more about this awesome shirt I'm wearing, which was designed by us, and also our brand new merch store. Our top story this week is the publication of a fascinating paper that has modelled how shark and ray species have responded to extinction events over the past 145 million years, which has turned up some rather surprising results. The question of what factors can be used to predict the risk of a species' extinction is something that evolutionary biologists have long investigated. Although the more traditional view held that the probability of a species going extinct is independent of how long that species has existed for, several recent studies have actually shown that the age of a species does in fact play a role in how likely extinction is. However, somewhat confusingly, when this age-dependent extinction likelihood has been detected, it's been found to be both positive and negative, meaning that in some groups of organisms, long-lived species are more likely to go extinct, whereas in other groups, it's the recently evolved species that are more likely to die out. So the relationship between the age of a species and extinction risk is complex, it turns out, and can vary between organisms depending on lots of different factors. In this new research, a group of scientists aim to investigate the relationship between the age of various shark and ray species across deep time and their extinction risk. Analyzing more than 20,000 fossils across the past 145 million years, since the end of the Jurassic period, they reconstructed when various species originated and died out. Incredibly, they found that there was indeed a relationship between species age and extinction risk, with shark and ray species being most vulnerable to extinction during the first 4 million years of their existence but older species were then more extinction resistant. The modelling of these origins and extinctions of species yielded other surprising results as well. The researchers revealed several previously unknown extinction events in the history of shark and ray evolution. In addition to the famous mass extinctions across this span of deep time, such as the end Cretaceous extinction when the asteroid collision wiped out the non-bird dinosaurs and sharks were also impacted, there were two other extinctions during the late Cretaceous that were not known about before, plus an event in the Paleocene to Early Eocene, and one in the Late Eocene to Early Oligocene. Although several of the older extinction events were then followed by new species of sharks and rays emerging in the wake of the destruction, another somewhat concerning surprise emerged from the modelling. After the more recent extinction events, the ones occurring from around 38 million years ago onwards, there was no net diversification of new species detected. So shark and ray species were being wiped out, but not enough new species were appearing to offset the losses. It's a fascinating new piece of research, with lots of very interesting implications for shark evolutionary history, and indeed, for their future. As one of the authors of the study has stated, modern sharks and rays have already lost much of their evolutionary potential, and have now also come under pressure from humans. Understanding their past helps us recognise how important it is to protect the species that still exist today. So sharks and rays are not quite as extinction-proof as they may have once seemed, with a gradually decreasing long-term diversity putting them at a higher risk from modern threats. Hopefully then, if conservation efforts can maintain their current levels of diversity for the foreseeable future, they will eventually undergo another diversification event in a few million years' time. The oceans without sharks and rays just wouldn't be the same. In other paleontology news, a wonderful paper has investigated the feeding habits of the herbivorous dinosaur Cetacosaurus, a small bipedal relative of the geologically much younger Triceratops. Cetacosaurus is known from numerous incredible fossil remains found across the early Cretaceous of Asia, with literally hundreds of complete individuals known to science, and some that even reveal what colours they were in life. 
This abundance of remains makes them an ideal candidate for studies into how dinosaur diets changed as these animals grew from babies into adults. Using a particular specimen that includes 13 complete small Cetacosaurus individuals buried together, this research found that all these dinosaurs were less than a year old when they died. Each juvenile Cetacosaurus also contained gastroliths within their body cavities, small polished stones that were swallowed by the animals to help them grind up tough plant matter in their stomachs. Previously, only older Cetacosaurus individuals were reported to have been found with gastroliths, but these skeletons show that the babies were swallowing stones too. So they presumably had the same diets when they were young as when they were adults, indicating that these were rather precocious little dinosaurs. Another fantastic discovery about this marvellous dinosaur, providing valuable insight into the life and growth of this important species. In other news this week, our stellar gaze once again drifts towards the third interstellar object ever to be detected in our solar system. That is, an object in our solar system that originated from outside it. It was discovered in July earlier this year and has attracted a large amount of interest from both the scientific community and the wider public. As Earth's detection systems get more and more advanced, it's expected that we'll detect many more interstellar objects like this in the future. It's been hypothesized that this could change the way we think about the early solar system and even planet formation. Well, this week, the interstellar object known as Atlas, or 3i Atlas, to designate it as the third interstellar object detected here, passed closer to Earth than it will ever go as it journeys through our solar system. Approaching a distance within 167 million miles, Atlas hasn't actually gotten particularly close to Earth. The closest distance between the orbits of Mars and Earth is 33.9 million miles, and Atlas actually got to just 19 million miles from Mars earlier in the year, which is fairly close in terms of our solar system. It's definitely attracted a lot of fans during its journey, and it will be interesting to see what other interstellar visitors we can detect and what they'll tell us about our universe. Now, we've had some weird planets here on 7 Days of Science, but a paper published this week in the Astrophysical Journal has revealed the discovery of a planet orbiting a tiny star that spins 700 times a second. It's shaped like a lemon, and it rains diamonds, and we don't know how. The exoplanet has a fairly long name that's mostly just numbers, so we're just going to call it Lemon Planet. Lemon Planet orbits a millisecond pulsar, the tiny remains of a once much larger star that still has the same mass as the Sun, despite being just a few miles in diameter. This pulsar spins about 700 times a second, ejecting twin beams of radiation that often blind telescopes that try to look at it. Not such a problem for the James Webb Space Telescope that sees a different frequency of radiation, infrared, giving it more of an opportunity to see into the system and to find out about Lemon Planet. Lemon Planet is about the size of Jupiter and very close to its star, just about a million miles away. This proximity pulls the planet into its lemon shape, as the intense forces from the nearby star pull at the planet's mass. But it's the planet's atmosphere that's the most peculiar. Its carbon-rich atmosphere should see that carbon combines with other elements under the excessive heat of the nearby pulsar, but it doesn't. Instead, the carbon occasionally cools and crystallizes into diamonds, raining from the planet's skies and possibly contributing to this strange cycle that allows the carbon to stay relatively pure. It's another mystery that scientists are determined to solve, and it'll be very interesting to see what observations come next from our lemon planet. Next up in the news, a remarkable new study has shown that being given a cocktail of messenger RNAs can actually rejuvenate the immune system's function in older individuals, making vaccines more effective and improving certain cancer treatments. The aging process has an erosive effect on the immune system, and as people get older, they produce fewer, less responsive, and less diverse kinds of T cells, one of the key white blood cell types in the immune system. This explains why vaccines can sometimes be less effective in older people, and also why cancer treatments that focus on using the immune system against tumors don't work as effectively the older you get. In this remarkable new study, scientists examined how mouse T cells change with age and identified three proteins that appear to play a crucial role in T cell aging. They then injected the messenger RNA, or mRNA, that encodes for these proteins into the livers of older mice and discovered that the mice with this added mRNA produced more T cells and responded much better to vaccines and cancer therapies compared to those without. Of course, much more testing needs to be done before this process could be applied to humans. 
but it does seem like a rather exciting breakthrough, especially since the identified proteins in mice are thought to play similar roles in humans as well. As one immunologist is quoted in a Nature article as saying, T-cell aging is not a fixed process. It is something that is modifiable. We can think about changing T-cell biology in a way that actually enables better health in the later years of life. Finally for the news, this week saw the publication of a paper in which scientists confirmed for the first time the presence of several viruses in whales living above the Arctic Circle, viruses that have all previously been linked to numerous cetacean strandings. The appearance of these viruses in Arctic waters adds to growing evidence that disease dynamics may be shifting as ocean conditions change and species ranges increasingly overlap. The exciting aspect of this study is the method used to collect the samples. Rather than relying on invasive techniques, scientists used drones to collect whale blow droplets from exhaled breath. This enabled respiratory samples to be gathered from live whales with minimal disturbance. Between 2016 and 2025, the research team sampled humpback, sperm, fin, and pilot whales. Cetacean morbillivirus was detected in humpback whales feeding in northern Norway, a sperm whale in poor health, and a stranded pilot whale. The study also identified herpes viruses in humpback whales across multiple regions. Importantly, no evidence was found of avian influenza or brucella, pathogens also linked to cetacean strandings. The authors note that dense feeding aggregations, particularly in winter, may increase opportunities for pathogen transmission where whales, seabirds, and human activities overlap. The researchers are very excited that the study demonstrates that drone blow sampling is an effective non-invasive tool for pathogen surveillance in cetaceans, and conclude that continued monitoring of disease exposure alongside other environmental stressors will be important for understanding health risks and informing conservation efforts for whales in the North Atlantic. Well, that's it for the news this week. I really hope you enjoyed learning about everything that's happened in these last seven days of science. Also, if you haven't seen the video over on the Benji Thomas channel about the speculative evolution of the Loch Ness Monster, we now have a revamped and much improved merch store, which will be linked down below. We're very pleased with our speculative Nessie design in particular. Here it is, on display for all of you to see. We're currently working on building a seven days of science shop as well, and that should be up and running soon. You can follow 7 Days of Science on Instagram and also be sure to support us on Patreon if you enjoy what we do here. As always, a big thank you to our patrons including Andrew Kawam, Kang Yen, Chippy Chippy Chapa Chapa, Clara Middleton, Dean A. Batha, Diana Hernandez, Drov Shuvastava, Gabriella, Gary Arrington, Giotist, I Rage, Juran Zydovic, John French, Joseph Ree, Josh Lambert, Corey Peterson, Lena Rose, Mark Nevin, Matt Grandis, Mendicant Fryer, Mike Pace, Monitor Man, Nicholas York, Ralph Balzac, Robert Prepajika Jr., Robert Thomas, Sammy Petrikus, Steve Bradshaw, Thomas F. Conroy III, Timothy N. Tedrow, Tracy Merrifield, and Troy Schmidt. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next week.